<laughs> can you hear me? I have to say this headset, I, I was telling my daughter Jaden this morning, I feel like an air traffic controller with this headset on, this headset on so I just wanted to make sure everyone could, could hear me this morning. It's such a, a joy to be here. It's such a blessing to be here. I, I, I really am encouraged by the things I saw here this morning in terms of the praise notes and uh, people praying for one another, celebrating that God answers prayer concerns. And, and even you are hospitable to me, even though I, I turned here and went in the wrong way and came in, <laughs> Jaden was like, Dad, that says one way. I was like, oh, I'm sure people do it all the time, Jaden. It's no big deal. <laughs> so, but uh, and the other thing I'm encouraged about today is that uh, your new pastor, Greg, I know Greg well, actually. Um, he, uh, he serves at my home church where I grew up, the Lagoda United Methodist Church, and he just retired. But uh, actually, um, Greg and I were ordained together. Um, we, uh, we stood on stage together when we were at an annual conference. And uh, actually, uh, I remember uh, we uh, went through the process of three years of ordination process in the United Methodist Church together. You're going to be blessed by Greg. He is a godly man. He's a good man, and he will love you, and I know you will love him. And see, that to me is what's important when it comes to the church. Well, today our uh, scripture reading does come from the book of Acts. I'm um, going to be reading from chapter 16. Um, he said it would be on the screen. There it is. All right. All right. So I had my phone ready. <laughs> Let's hear the word of God together. It says, next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia, and Galatia, because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then, coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So, instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace. And the next day we landed at Neapolis. From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She was baptized along with other members of her household and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. I'm going to stop. That's good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I, I share this uh, story this morning from the book of Acts because within the church calendar, today is a very special day. Today is, is Pentecost Sunday. Do we all know what Pentecost Sunday is? The, today really is like the birthday of the church. And to me, that story embodies the spirit of Pentecost. It embodies uh, the, the spirit of of God moving people to preach the, the good news of Jesus Christ to all the world. Uh, for me, Pentecost is a, um, a special day because it reminds us of the unity of the church. And what I mean by that is in the midst of all the diversity of people, the Pentecost reminds us that we are united as a people of God. I think it's interesting in the, in the story of Pentecost, uh, the story goes that the people were up in the upper room praying for the Holy Spirit to come. The key to that story to me is they were, they were praying. That's the most unifying thing we as Christians can do. There's so much that divides us as Christians today. 
Belief systems divide us. Social issues divide us. Denominations, they divide us. We are, we are divided in so many ways. But you know what the one unifying thing we have? It is prayer. There's no hierarchy in prayer. There's no denomination when it comes to prayer. We all have open access to God. Pentecost reminds us that we are, are united. Also, Pentecost reminds us that we are empowered, friends. We are empowered by the Spirit of God. There's a great story of an of a Eastern monk who went to a Catholic priest and, and asked the Catholic priest, he said, what is the Holy Spirit? To which the Catholic priest responded, he said, well, the Holy Spirit is the energy, the power, which comes from God. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk about what is it that we are supposed to do with the energy and the power that God has given us. And what I would like to suggest is that if nothing else, what we're supposed to do with the energy that God has given us is we as Christians are called to ensure that we keep the good news of Jesus Christ good news and not allow it to become bad news with our attitudes and our actions. Let me say that again. We are energized. We are empowered by God to do what? We are called to keep the good news of Jesus Christ good news and not bad news with our attitudes and our actions. The other day, I was reminded how quickly the good news becomes bad news. I was at the hospital visiting one of the parishioners at Methodist Temple and and it was a Sunday afternoon. It was a beautiful day like today, a wonderful day. I preached that morning, so I was all fired up, and I, I uh, volunteered to go visit people in the hospital. And, and one of the people I went to see, her name was Joanne. And, and Joanne's a longtime member of the church. She's one of those people that are infectiously optimistic, and she likes to talk. In fact, when I go see Joanne, I always mark it down for an hour because I know she's going to talk, and I'm going to hear all about everything that's happened in Joanne's life up to that point. I always feel encouraged, but I always know it's going to take me some time. Well, I went to go see Joanne, and uh, we were sitting there talking back and forth, and she was really positive. And all at once, a young man comes in, and he gives her her lunch. Puts the tray on, the, on, the, on her table right there, and Joanne, in typical Joanne fashion, looks at the young man and says, you're such a good young boy. Okay. To which the young man replies, no, I'm not good at all, he said. And now it was like an awkward silence. I was thinking, should I say something or should I shut up? <laughs> I'm a preacher, so I said something. And I looked at the young man and I said, you're being awful hard on yourself, aren't you? In hindsight, I should have not said anything at all because I had just stepped into this kid's trap. He said, no, I'm not good at all, he said. I am a liar. I am a thief, I'm an adulterer, and I'm thinking, this is getting weird. <laughs> At which point Joanne says, you know, you're talking to my pastor, and I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I thought I was through this, and here we go. At which point the young man looks at me and goes, really? Well, as if it was not wise that I was a pastor. And then he goes, he goes what's your confession of faith? Note to self, anytime someone asks you what your confession of faith is, there is no right answer. No right answer. And I said, well, I'm a United Methodist. And I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, like all Christians. That's what we're trying to do. He said, well, I've heard that answer before. And he went on some big tirade about Mary and Joseph and this and that. Then he looks at me again and he says, you know, I just want to make sure you're not one of those pastors who just tells people what they want to hear and then they can all just go to hell. At which time, point I was thinking, okay, dude, I've had about enough of this. I looked at him and I said, dude, I, I'm feeling really judged right now. He even had to answer that. He's rattled off something from Matthew that it's okay to judge and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at him and I said, whatever you're doing, it's not working. It's not working. At which point Joanne says, yeah, you're being really judgmental. And I'm like, thank you, Joanne. This is getting better. And finally, we just agreed to disagree, and we went on our separate ways. But on the way home that day, there was so much swirling around in my heart. I thought to myself, how could I have answered him differently? What could I have said? And the truth of the matter is, there was probably nothing I could have said. 
every time I got ready to answer, he already had the answer, and he just was trying to steamroll me over with his ideas about God and things like that. But then as I really thought about it, it occurred to me that, you know, it's people like that that are the reason that I hesitate sometimes when people ask me if I'm a Christian. Because I don't want to be lumped in with stuff like that. It occurred to me how quickly we take the good news of Jesus Christ and we allow it to become bad news. And what is the good news? What is the gospel? And for me, it could be simplified in just three very simple words. To me, the good news of Jesus Christ, friends, is that God is love. And if you really want to get down to it, you want to get down to one word, the gospel in a word. It's love. And if we want to keep the good news, the good news, we've got to live out the love of God in the way that we treat each other, the way we interact with one another. And so this morning, what I want to do is just give you like three very simple ideas on how to live this out and keep the good news, the good news. And the, and the way that I want to do that is just take a look at this story that I, I just read from Acts with all these big words of all these places that Paul went. I think within this story, what we find is some good stuff about how we can embody the gospel. I think the first thing that Paul teaches us in this story in the book of Acts is that the thing that Paul reminded me most in this story is that he was open to a new dream and he was open to a new vision about what God could do. The story goes, Paul's out and he's doing a missionary journey. He's enjoying a lot of success. He's going along preaching the gospel. And then all at once, what happens? One night, he has a dream, doesn't he? One night, he has a vision. And the question is, what's he going to do with that dream? And what's he going to do with that vision? If we want to keep the good news, the good news, friends, then we're going to have to be open to the possibility that God might do something new through us and through our churches. The image that comes to my mind is a story I heard about a young man who went to an elder teacher and said, he said, teacher, teach me the ways of God. The teacher said, okay, I'll teach you. Let's have some tea. The young man thought that's a weird way to answer that question, but he went, he went along with it. And so the, the, the old man and the young, the, the old man, the old teacher and the young man sat down and he gave him a cup and he began to pour the tea into the young man's cup. And he kept pouring the tea and he kept, he kept pouring the tea and he kept pouring the tea until finally the tea overflowed and burnt the young man's hand. The young man said, why in the world did you do that? And he said, well, you want me to teach you the ways of God, but your cup is already filled. I can't put something into a cup that is already filled. You see, friends, if we think we have all the answers, our cup is already filled. If we think that God just loves all the people that we love, our cup is already filled. If we think we have the cornerstone on the way things should be, our cup, is already filled. The first thing we have to understand, if we're going to keep the good news, the good news is that we have to understand that God's love is always a little bit bigger than our love. And God's world is always a little bit bigger than our world. And we're going to have to be willing to be open to new insights and new ways that we can share the love of God with other people. The second thing I would suggest that comes from our story about how to keep the good news is the good news is that we have to be willing to serve others and not ourselves. What's the dream that Paul has? What's the dream? The dream is there's a man and he says, come help us, right? And what's Paul do? He goes and he helps them. If we're going to keep the good news, the good news, we have to realize it's not about us. It's about other people. It's not about us and our way of doing things. It's about the community in which we live. It's about serving others. And believe me, I know that's a hard step. It's a hard step to go from the driver's seat to the passenger seat. That's the longest journey that we'll ever take to move from our driver's seat to the passenger seat. And believe me, I know because my daughter is 15 years old and she just got her driver's permit. Are you with me? (laughs) Here's the conversation. Dad is in the passenger seat. Jaden is in the driver's seat. And I'm saying slower, slower, slower. Oh, good, good. 
All right, there's a turn coming up. Five miles. Be ready. <laughs> Here it comes. Turn. Oh, great. Excellent. Faster. 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 Oh, let's take a break. I'll drive for a little longer. <laughs> I think there's a lot of truth in that, that little analogy. And the truth is this, friends. If we're going to truly embody the love of God, we're going to have to let other people get in the driver's seat. We really are. I mean, there's a whole world out there that needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And in order for them to hear the good news, we're going to have to serve them. And get out of the driver's seat and get in the passenger seat and encourage them and lift them up. Because we need some more drivers out on the road, right? <laughs> I'm not going to be able to drive Jaden forever one day. The, the, the roles are going to be turned. Yep. So it's always about the other. It's always about the other. And the last thing I would suggest as I think about this story today, about how to keep good news, good news, is that, and this is probably the most challenging one, it's not about the way we've always done it. Instead, it's about what needs to be done. Or to say it in a different way, it's not about the letter of the law. It's about the spirit of the law. What needs to be done in order that we can love the people that God is bringing into our lives? The thing that, that occurs to me about this story is that as Paul is going on this missionary journey, he has a vision. And in that vision, what does he see? He sees a man. Paul lived in a man's world. The first century context was a patriarchal society. Men were in charge of business. Men were in charge of spiritual affairs. Uh, men were in charge of the household. Men, men, men. And so when he had a vision about going to Macedonia to preach the gospel, he saw a man. But as the story unfolds, what happens when he gets there? What's he find? He finds a woman. And what's she doing? Well, we know she's leading a prayer meeting. We know that she is a business leader. She's selling expensive purple cloth. And we know that she's the head of the household because she has the authority to get the whole household baptized after she becomes a Christian. And so what's that tell us? Uh, Paul was willing to put aside the way he always did things in order that he could love the person and the people that God had brought into his life. You see, friends, any church can grow as long as we're willing to do one thing, not be particular about who God brings. Not be particular about who walks in the door. Not be particular about who the people are that God is calling us to love. It was last week I was in my annual interview with uh, the assistant district superintendent, Randy Anderson. And in that annual interview, we were talking about plans for the future. That's what we preachers do. And I remember about mid-conversation, I stopped and I said, you know what, Randy? This is my hope for the Methodist church. This is my hope for the church. My, my hope for the church is that we just get to the point where we start loving people again. We quit chewing each other up. We quit biting each other and going on about this, that, and the other thing. But we would remember that the point of it all is that we are empowered by the Spirit of God to, to love our communities and love our neighbors because that's the gospel. That's the point. And so here's my prayer for McCutcheonville. I don't know your story. You don't really know my story. <laughs> but here's my prayer for us all. That we would simply choose to love the people that God has brought into our lives because when we do, we never know when the hand of Christ is going to be willing to reach back and touch our lives. My grandmother uh, was a big fan of E. Stanley Jones and I think E. Stanley Jones said it really well. He said, at the end of the day, the most important thing we can ever do is that we can model our lives after the mind and spirit of Jesus Christ. Because no life is worth living no world is worth having. And friends, no church is worth building that's not modeled after the mind and the spirit of Jesus Christ. So what do we do with the energy that God has given us? We model our lives after Christ. That's the good news of Pentecost. 
And that's all I got. That's all I got. I'm just, uh, but I think we have probably a closing song. This is, right? Closing song, we do that. Even better. Even better. Uh, you left me 10 minutes, I get to talk about you. You get to talk about me? Yeah. Oh, well, you didn't tell me my time limit. I could have gone on. Uh, okay, all right, all right. All right. Well, thank you for having me and putting up with me today. Yep. Yeah. <laughs>